Well, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for uh, attending. Um, I should uh, say from the start that I'm not a, a rangeland ecologist. I'm really more an evolutionary conservation ecologist, but of course, I'm interested in the impacts of herbivory on uh, the composition and direction of ecosystems that we have here uh, in New Zealand. I think the other caveat is that we don't really use the term rangeland in New Zealand. Um, we... Uh, but we do have areas of the country that are grazed uh, by sheep and cattle, and we tend to refer to them as the high country rather than as rangeland uh, uh, per se. But so if you accept that, uh, that similarity, then what I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this slot is really the evolution of rangelands and how, uh, what sort of challenges, if you like, we face in the future. Now, to understand our rangelands, you really have to understand the history of human settlement in New Zealand, and it's relatively recent compared to uh, other parts of the world. Uh, Maori, uh, Polynesian settlers arrived here uh, in the 13th century as part of an eastward migration out of uh, Asia, uh, and uh, we were one of the last, if you like, major land masses in the world to be settled by humans. They brought with them uh, not many animals, but the Polynesian uh, or the Pacific rat, sorry, or Kiori, uh, certainly uh, arrived with them and caused major impacts on the biota. But the major disturbance they brought with them was fire. And uh, as I'll mention later on, this was something novel in the New Zealand system. We did have fire, but not regularly. Uh, but through the use of fire, they transformed uh, the landscape, particularly in drier parts of New Zealand. And there were major extinctions associated with their arrival, predominantly from hunting, uh, and certainly uh, the ratites, the moa silhouetted here, uh, was one of those uh, groups, if you like, that was taken out uh, very early on in Polynesian settlement. So if we look at the landscape and try and understand sort of Polynesian influence on it, uh, on the left there, you'll see a, a, a sequence going from Valley 4 grassland through to uh, forest, in this case, mainly Nothophagus forest, up into the Alpine grassland. So we did have primary grasslands, uh, the Alpine and in the Valley floors would have been two situations where we would have had open habitats for a very long period of time. But what the Polynesian burning did, certainly in the East and South Island, was take out that middle zone of forest and replace it with extensive grasslands. And these were sourced from species that were in the Alpine and species that were also associated with these uh, lowland uh, valley floor grasslands. But one of the features then of these grasslands was that they, they weren't just dominated by grass. Certainly after fire, immediately after fire, there were short and then tall bunch grasses got established. But from then on, there was this natural progression back towards woody vegetation. This could involve shrubs shown here or bracken fern, which is, uh, of course, uh, a native species, but widespread uh, throughout the world. And uh, it's not clear whether Maori deliberately burnt these areas subsequently to maintain access and habitat. We suspect they may well have done to a certain extent, but certainly fire had to be used to remove the woody vegetation to stop these areas returning to forest. Europeans, of course, arrived about 500 years later, and they certainly were primarily from Europe, out of Britain, uh, Scots in particular in this part of the world, uh, settled and saw these extensive grasslands and saw them as golden opportunities uh, for grazing and there was further clearance, but associated with European settlement, we get, and I show a few of them here, a huge number of birds and mammals that were introduced into the New Zealand system. Herbivores, carnivores, uh, omnivores, all arriving essentially at the one time and released into the New Zealand situation. We also had a lot of introduced um, plant species and uh, Californian poppies uh, shown here, but um, nowadays the introduced flora matches the indigenous or native flora in New Zealand. So we have a huge number of species that have been released from all around the world, from North America, from Europe, 
uh, and from Asia who have been released to New Zealand uh, for a variety of purposes, some of them deliberate, some of them uh, accidental. And then we had a further raft of extinctions, again, mainly birds, uh, that um, the, uh, the, the number of extinctions was, was literally uh, halved again. So, so we only have about half of our original native avian fauna uh, in New Zealand. The arrival of sheep and cattle uh, into New Zealand and the stocking of these grasslands was a, a, a huge undertaking. Uh, the stocking densities were just massive. They, there were thousands and thousands of animals released into these grasslands because they saw them as uh, extensive opportunities, if you like, to start a, a, an industry that would earn New Zealand money through exports, essentially. So there was regular burning, uh, sometimes on an annual basis, and so our grasslands, the shrubs and woody component of the vegetation um, disappeared uh, very quickly. Uh, but also the grasses disappeared. They were not as resilient as uh, many of the early uh, settlers assumed. And very quickly, we got extensive areas shown there on the far right, where we have um, essentially very little vegetation. We have um, uh, some native uh, prostate species being able to colonize, but uh, essentially it was denuded of vegetation. And stocking rates in the uh, late uh, 1800s and early 1900s plummeted because the, the landscape couldn't support the intensity of grazing. It was exacerbated by other feral grazers that we introduced into New Zealand. Here we have rabbits, and uh, they caused widespread uh, depletion of the vegetation and biomass available. And um, they're still with us, and they resurface as a problem every now and again. Um, but there was a lot of blame put on the rabbits for causing some of the depletion, but really it was a combination of overstocking, certainly overburning, and uh, the addition of the rabbits. Now, along with that, in terms of understanding rangeland um, evolution, if you like, in New Zealand, we had a range of shrub uh, weeds. Here we have rosa, uh, broom, and, uh, and gorse that most of you will be familiar with. And these certainly came in and um, benefited from the uh, depletion of the native biomass. But also we had some, some flat weeds and other uh, weeds of importance, uh, sorrel, uh, nacella tussock, which was a, a particular uh, problem for the wool industry, and more recently, um, pilocella, a flat weed that dominated many of these landscapes. Now, there's always been a debate in terms of rangeland management in New Zealand about whether or not these are super weeds or do we have a degraded ecosystem, a vulnerable ecosystem that was just waiting for any weed to come into. And so, and that controversy kind of continues uh, through to today about what is the driving cause? Is it, is it the intrinsic characteristic of the weed or is it the nature of the recipient ecosystem? At that time, there was concern also about erosion, and this was attributed to overgrazing. Um, erosive features are quite widespread, certainly in our mountainous areas. Uh, and the response to that was to go to the Northern Hemisphere, particularly America, and introduce a whole lot of conifers. Um, I think we've virtually introduced just about all of the conifers available. Uh, uh, to uh, be planted in New Zealand and we trialled them. And today we have a problem in our grasslands that are frequently used uh, for rangelands where we have these invasive conifers. Now we completely misinterpreted the situation. It really wasn't due to rangeland mismanagement. It was in fact a, um, it reflected if you like, the tectonic activity that takes place along the Alpine Fault, which um, splits the South Island, and we get these very frequent earthquakes. And so much of this had a history that preceded human settlement and uh, may have been exacerbated locally by some grazing, but in fact was not a feature of uh, rangeland mismanagement. So the erosion, the degradation of the system resulted in, a, in, in just numerous reviews. They had review after review after review, and it precipitated the establishment of a slightly unusual form 
of land management in New Zealand called the Crown Pastoral Land Act. And this is where the Crown retains ownership of the land, but the grazing rights are privatised and um, sold, if you like, to individual um, owners. But th this, this privatisation is held in perpetuity. They, you can sell your grazing rights, but essentially the pastoral rights uh, are there for someone to own forever and a day. And this has caused us qu uh, quite a lot of angst in the history of uh, rangeland management in New Zealand. Just what exactly those rights are. What are the rights of the Crown versus what are the rights of the person or group or company owning uh, those grazing rights. Now, we also have Crown land, where, which has some grazing uh, leases given on it, and that, that's slightly different from the Crown pastoral land, because those grazing leases can come and go. And also, we have private land uh, that is, is rangeland today. Now, it, it's hard, it, one of the things that um, we need to understand about rangeland evolution and development in New Zealand was the the paradigm that drove it, if you like, and it's it's really evident in the writings of people like Bruce Levy uh, in the middle of last century when he was writing about the history of grassland development in New Zealand, that, that intensification uh, was a key component of it. They, they realised very quickly that our soils um, lacked many of the, uh, uh, the fertiliser requirements that were needed for introduced palatable or end fixing exotic species. And without that, if you had to rely on extensive grazing of native systems, then it really wasn't going to work. We couldn't get the stocking rates or the profitability. And the agribusiness model that drove a lot of our rangeland development really hinged around exporting. At the moment, we produce enough food uh, to, to feed about 60 million people. And we only have 5 million people. But right back then, it was pretty clear that if New Zealand was going to earn an income, we had to export uh, across the world. We couldn't do it just by internally providing for people here. And so the business model really was, was one that was driven by exports. And throughout our, our, our history of certainly since European settlement in New Zealand, land values have invariably been well in excess of what the agri agricultural income could potentially be. The value of the land just seemed to be uh, enormous compared to what you could earn from it. And that's really been a history of, uh, of land right through to the present day, especially because we don't have any capital gains tax. So if we look at the, at the, at the environments that rangeland encompasses in New Zealand, we start off with a country uh, essentially that it was forested. We see during Polynesian settlement, um, the areas of yellow increasing as grasslands uh, expanded, if you like, through following Polynesian fires. We see more of that continuing with European settlement as we move to the right there. And if we look at the range of environments, they're essentially transitional environments. They, they, they're environments that are um, in the rain shadow, if you like, of the main Southern Alps in the South Island and, and even in North Island. It is these where you go from very high rainfall through to dryland systems that you see much of our rangeland. There are intrinsic evolutionary challenges for having rangelands in New Zealand. And, and, and I guess the the first one is that we have a mammal naive grassland ecosystem. New Zealand has never had uh, grazing herbivores in our system, apart from the mower, and I'll talk about them uh, in a while. But um, essentially, we've been dominated by birds. We do have some grazing, uh, some, uh, if you like, grassland birds. The curious thing is that they, they have peculiar feeding requirements. So shown in the, in the right there is one of them, the um, endemic endangered uh, flightless rail, the Takahi, which is now found uh, in the Alpine zone in Fiordland, but has been re-established on some offshore islands and uh, other grassland areas. And essentially it feeds on the seeds, but also the basal meristems of the tillers of these bunch grasses. Moa certainly were found in the grasslands, the large ratite birds shown here, and um, uh, obviously uh, uh, use the grasslands, 
but grass doesn't appear much in the diet uh, from the gizzard evidence that we've been able to get from um, swamps and other systems where the gizzards are preserved, limestone caves, etc. They, they, they use the grasslands, they fed on a lot of the small forbs, but grasses per se don't appear to have been a major part of their diet. So in the evolution of these systems then, we, they haven't had a lot of experience, if you like, of certainly ruminant grazing. In the study I did with Joe Crane a few years ago, we compared the, the tissue characteristics of native versus exotic grasses at a whole lot of common sites along a rainfall gradient. And, and, and when you look at them in terms of elevation, and here we have the exotic introduced species shown as black dots and the native species shown as um, uh, empty circles, uh, you can see they, they, they split out on this uh, quite clearly. Um, that, that they, they have different nutrient strategies, different growth strategies. And the natives, there's relatively low levels of nitrogen, certainly less than 1%. Um, and they have a very high shoot to root ratio. In other words, most of the biomass is above ground. There's very little uh, below ground that would act as part of a resilient strategy in response to grazing. The other thing is that we have very few native uh, uh, nitrogen fixing uh, forbs uh, at all in New Zealand. And there's an issue about why is that so? Is it, is it something we just missed out on or is it something to do with our environment? I still think we don't really understand that very clearly. I mentioned previously that, that humans when we arrived brought fire and uh, it was pretty clear from work that Kevin O'Connor did that if you have you know, unburnt, ungrazed systems, then there was some kind of sort of biomass status showing there. But if you burnt every three years but uh, didn't graze, then then even under that regime, there was a there was a gradual uh, uh, decline in biomass availability. But if you mixed it with grazing, then very quickly you you ran out of biomass. And 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 the issue there is that when the when the tussocks re-sprout and uh, the early settlers were after that re-sprouting to get fresh, nutrient-rich tissue for grazers. When they re-sprouted and, the, and, and those re-sprouts were, were focused on by grazing animals, then it, it very quickly killed um, the tussocks themselves. Now, one of the other challenges that was faced, and I suppose you can consider it an evolutionary challenge in the sense that it reflects the, the weather, there were, there were numerous episodic storms, uh, and, and, and these were, were, were high rainfall events or snow events in particular that really did um, take out a lot of animals in rangeland that couldn't be shifted quickly to other areas. And we had also periodic droughts where they just we just ran out of fodder. And these events kind of shaped what sort of resources would be needed to make those rangelands more sustainable, i.e. access to low country on the one hand, and on the other hand, some way of mitigating the effect of periodic droughts. I mentioned previously we don't have any or many nitrogen fixing forbs, and a long-standing research issue in the high country has been the establishment of legumes, um, introduced legumes that would provide high quality fodder. And uh, as long as I've been an ecologist, uh, this has uh, driven, if you like, a lot of high country uh, research. And I think we still struggle to do that in general as a mixture in the grasslands. But what we have done is been able to concentrate it in certain areas. But clovers, lucerne, lupins uh, are all being used in different ways to try and create a more productive uh, forage environment for stock. The problems have been um, phosphorus uh, deficiency, sulfur and molybdenum have been some of the uh, elements that have kind of been lacking uh, in these systems. And so unless you can get fertilizer on these areas, then it's hard to sustain rangelands. So when we look at the landscape today, we see uh, a general uh, segmentation of it. And one of the big changes that's taken place is that we have used fertilizers to sustain really high quality forage crops to finish off cattle or sheep to get good prices um, in the market. 
and the uh, um, native uh, dominated system above that has really uh, just been used for extensive grazing uh, throughout uh, the summer months. But this has resulted in an overall intensity of farming in these environments. Interestingly, if you look at the data for this century, the 21st century, uh, stock numbers have actually declined by about 30%. And I got these figures from Statistics New Zealand. Um, so stocking density has certainly declined. But if you look at the fertilizer application for the high country, it's actually doubled this century, particularly phosphorus to a lesser extent, nitrogen. And this trajectory is exactly the same as daring, which is the personification of intensification in the New Zealand situation. And I suspect this increase in fertilizer application um, that's taken place in the last two decades is really around these winter crops in particular and providing the supplementary feeding. Now, rangelands face competition, if you like, from other land uses, and I just show three here. I mean, one is the recreational tourism area, and hiking in the high country and, you know, other sort of economic land uses. Um, this was obviously pre-COVID, it's slightly changed now. Um, forestry is another land use that uh, has is gaining traction, partly because it's now being sold under the banner of carbon sequestration and to mitigate climate change effects. And so it's, it's getting some credibility like that. And in other areas, I mean, we saw the promo for the deer industry early on and uh, deer farming and, and trophy deer uh, activities are also uh, competing for land. One big change has been access to water. A lot of these uh, rangeland areas certainly lacked water to get the productivity that people wanted. And so there's been a rapid transition from rangeland to dairy farming, where topography has allowed an access to water. Now, water is quite a contentious issue in the New Zealand context, because by and large, outside of some urban areas, people don't pay for it. And so there are lots of debates about who owns the water, um, abstraction in these particular environments, uh, can have quite dramatic effects, not only on the quality of the water table below, but also on whether or not there is uh, access by alternative users for other sources. And so there is ongoing debate about how we should use water. So there's been rapid land use change and what have been traditional rangeland or grazing areas have been captured for um, more intensive land use. And there's very few constraints under existing legislation for this land use change. It kind of catches us by surprise. Uh, each generation as we see this rapid change and then we sort of react and respond. And this diagram just shows some changes in the McKenzie country. In 1990, those um, bright green areas are intensification. And you can see through to uh, a few years ago, there was uh, you know, a, a tripling of the area at least that was under intensification and therefore wasn't available uh, for rangeland. One of the issues that we have with rangelands in New Zealand is that these open habitats have lots of biodiversity values. They represent either you know, key natural environments or they're a, 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 a home for native plants and animals. And we have lots of regional differentiation, which kind of uh, means that these areas are important as refugia uh, for native species. And so there is this, this um, ongoing discussion between the role of using them for grazing versus um, the options we might have for conservation and protection. And here with these special habitats that occur within these rangelands that have their own unique uh, flora and fauna, they have threatened species, and um, often they're part of the rangeland mix, but because of their vulnerabilities, need special sorts of protection. And so it's how we kind of... Um, discuss all of this in the context of rangeland. It's only really become important, or, or we've only begun to understand it, if you like, over the last um, decade or so, how important these open non-forest habitats have been in the evolution of the New Zealand biota. And I just show a picture there of a, um, a cicada, uh, a skink, and uh, a, a shrub genus, Veronica or Hebe in New Zealand. And those percentages re represent the number of taxa in these diverse groups 
that have evolved in non-forest open habitat below regional tree line. And that is in the rangeland environments, these taxes, taxa have their uh, core, if you like, evolutionary history. And we're just beginning to understand that. So, so there is this competition between how do these um, components of the biota fare in a grazing situation. So if we stand back and also think about the provision of ecosystem services, there are challenges here too. Because a lot of our rangelands are in upper parts of the catchment. And so if intensification occurs here, then it's going to trickle down throughout the catchment. And we're already having problems in lower parts of these catchments, whereby water quality um, and local erosion is having an impact. And so it, it, if we're going to um, intensify in the upper parts of the catchments, then it, it's going to have significant consequences. And so these areas in upland environments are really important for ecosystem services. There are ethical challenges, I think, as we look to the future for rangelands. And um, we currently claim that the world needs the food uh, we provide, because as I said before, most of it is export, and the wool and textiles uh, for clothing the world. Now, I think it's, it's really debatable whether we are feeding or fattening the minority world. Because if you do an analysis of where Fonterra products go, sheep and beef products go, because we're locked into a high value system in terms of sustaining um, what we do on the land in New Zealand, we have to sell to markets that can afford our products, whether it's merino garments or whatever. And uh, this really commits us to skewing where we export our food to countries that can afford it. And by and large, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. It really goes to other countries that necessarily depend on or need this food. And so there's a real challenge, if you like, an ethical challenge in terms of not just for rangelands, but for food production as a whole in New Zealand, in terms of where we send it and how we push this sustainability, clean, green image that we like to portray. Climate change is, a, is, is also a challenge because I said before, these rangelands are in traditional uh, transitional environments. And we know that over the next few decades, we're going to get more precipitation along the Southern Alps and therefore more, if you like, uh, flooding events from those systems that uh, start in the Alps and go east. Uh, but also in the east generally in a rain shadow area, we're going to get storm events, sure, but also overall, we're probably going to get periods of extended drought. And we're seeing that already in some of the upland systems uh, in the South Island, where um, the, the grasslands themselves are exhibiting an increased vulnerability. So how we manage these systems is going to be a big issue for us in the future. The social license to operate, I guess, is something that you'll have discussed previously, but we have animal health issues. We have changes from animal to plant-based dietary uh, trends, and we have environmental issues that are becoming contentious. So we have assumed in the past that we can uh, farm in what we term a traditional way, but, 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 but I suspect that that could well be changing, certainly in a post-COVID world, when we struggle to see how we can make our farms truly uh, sustainable and what we should be producing from them that essentially decarbonizes the world. Some people have argued that we need in New Zealand these middle landscapes. This is something that Jeff Park, uh, a landscape ecologist, um, who uh, talked about. And I mean, this was before Lord of the Rings became fashionable, but these middle landscapes are where we could have both extra people uh, living and, uh, and working the land, as well as indigenous biodiversity. And this is often argued in the New Zealand context that can't we have these, these middle landscapes where both activities can occur? Next slide, please. And what I've tried to sort of explain in this talk is actually quite challenging because of the evolutionary history of the native biodiversity in New Zealand. So, you know, should we have land sparing or land sharing? And in that context, um, I think land sharing is really problematic. 
land sparing can work, but it's really scale dependent. How are we going to petition the landscape to both protect our indigenous biodiversity, provide the ecosystem services that we value on the one hand, and on the other, allow us to do forms of agriculture that are compatible with the environmental limits that we find in New Zealand. So petition landscapes, whether they're multi-landscapes or what, I don't know what you'd call them, um, I think uh, potentially a way forward. The trouble is in New Zealand, and I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in New Zealand, we actually lack the legislation to manage landscapes. And this comes up time and time again. We lack both the legislation for landscape management, but also for land use management in New Zealand at a broad scale. In the past, we have attempted to fossilize certain types of land use, and that really hasn't served us well um, because change occurs all the time. In general, extractive land uses have limited currency in the modern environment where you just take, take, take. We do have to put resources back into the landscape. But our one of the issues that we face in New Zealand is that virtually all that comes off the land is exported to other countries overseas. And we really do have the challenge of trying to work at doing that in ways that is not only good for New Zealand, but good for the planet. Just want to say thanks very much for attending. Um, and I'm happy to uh, ask, answer questions. And there's been a number of people that have helped me uh, develop my thoughts one way or another um, over the time that I've been uh, looking at uh, indigenous ecosystems in New Zealand. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bill. That was really quite a lot of information. And I feel um, it, it really exhibits the complexity that we're dealing with when we think about the future of rangelands in uh, Aotearoa. Um, I want to open up the forum again, as usual, to questions if people have them. Is in um, California, you can do land sharing because there are actual benefits to grazing on our grasslands, which are by and large not, you know, a mix of indigenous and non native species, probably dominated by non native species now. Um, and I just heard a talk about uh, Kazakhstan where there's some evidence that grazing helps maintain biodiversity, but that is not the case you're saying at all in New Zealand. In other words, grazing, there's no regeneration of the nutrients removed by grazing. So it doesn't, it doesn't confer any benefits. I, I don't know that that's strictly because of the evolutionary history, because our grassland uh, well, we have some grazing. Anyway, is that true? <laughs> what um, I really enjoyed your talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that was one of the worst asked questions ever. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's fine. I, I think I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, in New Zealand, it's true that there are some components of biodiversity that, that can cope with grazing, but I would say they cope with it rather than necessarily um, flourish. And it also tends to truncate the natural succession. But we have um, ephemeral wetlands with very uh, prostate turfs that grow around them. And, and they can certainly cope with sheep grazing. And what the sheep do, they, they, they sort of maintain the turfs uh, and, the, and, and often extend them. Um, and we have some forms of early cereal and common uh, vegetation types that that can be maintained by grazing but it's normally uh it's sheep rather than cattle who are just too heavy and create uh, inroads into these into these systems but what you end up is is you end up with a lot of um common species if you like widespread species being maintained in these grazing systems rather than some of the regionally unique and distinctive components of biodiversity that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> morning, Bill. Thanks for yep. the presentation. It was uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, just in, in terms of where you got to with the um, uh, starting with that Jeff Park um, quote, talk about discussion about middle middle landscapes and then land sparing or land sharing. Um, perhaps you could reflect on the successes and failures of 
uh, and future direction of tenure review then in regards of that they have to explain to the overseas audience um, yeah. what tenure review is yeah sure um I think we discussed, uh, or I mentioned the Crown Pastoral Land Act of 1938, whereby we set up this slightly unusual uh, system whereby the Crown owned the land, but the pastorage rights were, were privatised. And a uh, couple of decades ago now, the government decided that they really wanted to tidy that up and decide what land should go to conservation uh, and what land should be privatise, so, so take it out of this Crown pastoral land situation. And for a while now, we've run the system whereby the, the people that owned the pastoral rights were able to discuss with the government and come to some agreement about what they would privatise and then what would um, go uh, formally to the Crown under some normally conservation uh, status. And uh, that system progressed. It, the outcomes, I think, for folk that uh, engaged with that and completed it, I think they found it um, administratively quite frustrating. I mean, it was, it was a prolonged exercise, but um, they tended to end up with a lot of the low country and uh, the high country went to the government and uh, was set aside, as I say, primarily for conservation. It's caused a number of issues. There's debates about the price that the Crown paid for the land. Um, it also meant that a lot of land went to conservation that was serial in character and had a grazing history. And so had its own inherent vulnerabilities with weed invasion and the like, and who was to control that. Um, and also there emerged the issue that all this land in, in the high country that was being destocked was gaining not only in biodiversity values, but a fuel load. And so potentially in the future, uh, under a warmer climate, we could get more extensive fires. And so they are, they are the kind of debates, but it, it was an exercise in partitioning the land, what you could graze and develop more intensively versus what would go back uh, to conservation. And so that's the way it's gone ahead. Now, there are residual native biodiversity values in the areas that was privatised. And so there's still ongoing debates about how those should be looked after and recognised. Um, my feeling is that the scale of the partitioning was too large. I think, and a lot of farmers are practising this today, is that you can set aside areas on your farm for certain sort of national benefits there's another discussion about how we recognize those benefits in terms of the payment to farmers. Um, but if you set aside areas, either for riparian protection, for networking biodiversity, I, I still think you can have a, a, a level of um, agriculture, if you like, in some of these landscapes that um, can benefit uh, biodiversity. The challenge is, will that be economic for the agricultural activity? I mean, can we undertake agricultural activity that will uh, provide a rate of return? And the way in which land prices are going in New Zealand, I think that's really, it, it's, it's very hard to do. Um, just a supplementary, um, yeah. uh, just in terms of the future of pastoral leases then, whether legislation is going through to actually provide for, um, shall we say, a, a more balanced long-term rangeland management. Do you see that as being um, a good direction? Um, I, I just don't know what balanced rangeland management looks like. Uh, in the past, I don't think we've been able to achieve a balance in New Zealand, in part because of the heterogeneity of the landscape, but in part also because of this intensification driven sort of, uh, it's virtually an ideology in agriculture and in a lot of activities on the land, whereby we've, we're always trying to increase stocking rates or um, increase pasture production or whatever. It, it just seems to be a treadmill that we've got on. I mean, I agree with you in terms of, could we, could we go back to something? And, uh, and we could, we could release a few sheep into the high country and I think we could work that system so it was manageable. Whether it will be economic or not, I don't know.
we have a couple of questions. I think one from Tony Waterhouse. Uh, Tony, please go ahead, ask your question. Yes, hi there. Yeah, enjoyed your talk, really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to ask a slightly more profound question. I, I mean, I come from, from, I'm working currently in Scotland, and uh, when the glaciers left us 10,000 years ago, and we had a reintroduction of, uh, of not intro, introduction of animals, but also of grazing a few millennia ago, but have we not been just make, making mistakes ever since? Uh, at what point mm. we know when we've got it right, and who will decide? when it's right. I think like, a lot of the comments you've put in have been, you know, previous times we got it wrong, but how will we know when we get it right in, in, in your context? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, at the moment, a lot of it's been driven through water quality and, uh, and we've had this argument about, you know, should we set standards that make all our rivers swimmable or drinkable or whatever? And, uh, and I think that actually in the future is going to drive a lot of land use decisions that we make in New Zealand. So it's going to be spillover effects. Um, so when we get it right, I think we will have, in New Zealand anyway, uh, good representation of indigenous biodiversity, and that is, you know, no extinctions, et cetera. Uh, but also we will have um, high water quality throughout. And I suspect that would be one indicator um, and biodiversity, indigenous biodiversity will play, I suspect a key part of that. It requires, I mean, people talk about a win-win situation and, 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 and what, what we see in New Zealand often is, 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 is that, that the, the natural environment is always on a lose-lose in terms of what we do with it, whether it's urban expansion or rural expansion or intensification or whatever. And so we have to, we have to some way say that it, we want to live in this place in a way that the environment, if you like, is sustained, protected, and the resources that we all need are there for future generations. So it, it's, it's one of these big challenges, but um, I really don't, I think the, the concept of balance, the concept of win-win, in my experience, has always meant that the environment loses out. Mm. And how we turn that around, I don't know. So uh, her, Carolyn's question is, what about the input from the indigenous people, Maori, in legislation impacting land use? For example, Naitahu in the South Island. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the really encouraging components of modern land use decisions, that the indigenous people now um, are becoming uh, an essential and an integral part of a lot of these major land use decisions. So I, I think it's, it's actually very good. Um, now, in some areas of biodiversity, there's going to be, a, I mean, as, as I understand it, and I'm not an authority on this, but uh, many of the indigenous people see uh, some extractive land use persisting in the future, and I, I don't have a problem with that. It's the level and type and how that impacts on the system as a whole. And in general, they want to preserve the system, but they also might want to log the occasional totra or take uh, uh, eels or, or whatever. And I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but uh, I think they're bringing up a really healthy perspective and whether it's estuarine management or management in the high country, I think they have an essential uh, role to pay, play. And I, I, I think it's great that um, they're, uh, they are requiring, if you like, as part of treaty partnerships discussions that they are involved in these land use decisions. I had a question for you, Bill. Um, so you, you said that there is, you know, there is a lack of legislation in terms of understanding land use and land use change and on the landscape scale. So one of the, one of the things which strike me as being kind of important is that, like for example, uh, the top 10 private landowners um, in New Zealand are all, um, out of them seven are foreign companies, um, which own between them more than a million hectares and growing, right? And out of, in that list of top 10, five are forestry companies. Right. So what we see is this, I would call it uh, this very corporate conservation ethic entering this land and slowly, you know, selling pieces of it to foreigners, essentially. Um, 
for me, one of the like a question that I had is, uh, yes, there is a need for conservation. There is a need for let's say protecting some of these landscapes. But do you think you know it's coming at the cost of autonomy? It's coming at the cost of ownership. It's coming at the cost of who gets to decide what happens with that land, because it seems like you know, in some ways, forestry or conservation is being used to actually change ownership of land in New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that when you, you know, go, go back to the, the 19th century, I mean, it's always been like that. The British companies came over here and, you know, purchased so-called vast tracts of land, which they then sort of sold to uh, settlers in one form or another. So we always seem to have it. I, I don't mind so much the foreign ownership. I just think we've got to get our act together about how we make land use decisions in New Zealand. And um, it's, the, it's the lag. Like here in, 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 in Otago in Southland, like over a period of 10 years, virtually the whole floodplain of the Matara River went from uh, sheep and beef to dairy. And that was a massive change and nothing happened. I mean, we just seemed to be able to, you know, we couldn't do anything about it. So whether we impose limits or, you know, how do we do it? It requires a skill set that's far greater than mine in terms of policies. Um, but uh, these changes just happen. So in terms of overseas ownership, no, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that'll, well, most of us are, are foreigners in this country one way or another anyway, but, uh, I think we, as a country, we've just got to get our act together and focus uh, on uh, limiting, if not, not so much limiting, just setting environmental limits for the land that cannot be exceeded. And a lot of my farming friends ask me, well, what do we do? And I say, well, I actually don't mind what you do on your land as long as it has no impact on your neighbours or the stream or the whatever. So, you know, I would, I would argue for nil nitrogen runoff and, you know, these sorts of things. Really, and say, these are our bottom lines. What you do on the land, how you make your living, yeah, okay, whatever, um, as long as you don't uh, contribute to modification of those bottom lines. Forestry would be impacted because, I mean, episodically, every rotation, they have a huge impact on sediment load. And so that, that would be an issue there. Um, but we just don't seem to be able to do that. And as I say, I think water quality is one area where I think we may be making some gains. Um, one of the questions I also had is, you know, uh, I've done a bit of work with, you know, emissions and emissions trading and all that. So one of the things that I see is, you know, in most rangelands across the world, a lot of the carbon is actually fixed under the ground, right? Yeah. However, a lot of ETS systems sort of are almost fix fixated on terrestrial carbon. Yeah. And then they, they kind of see these lands as being, you know, they need improvement, right? Yeah. We need to carbon in enrich or whatever it is. However, what they're always suggesting is some kind of terrestrial carbon enrichment. Um, my question is, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not saying I buy into this idea completely, but what if there was some kind of a, you know, payment for ecosystem services set in for some of these uh, big agricultural uh, landowners where, you know, they could allow big parts of their land to just remain and, you know, have some of the soil carbon through ETS give them some of the, some benefits. And why do you think that the New Zealand government hasn't sort of, you know, been more proactive around including soil carbon within the ETS? I, well, I'm not quite sure, but I, th I thought internationally they were concerned to see uh, soil carbon included, but uh, that's probably a bigger issue than I'm really able to comment on. I don't, um, I mean, I think in terms of the ETS, I would like to see it around, a, a expanded, if you like, to include other ecosystem services, particularly water, um, and uh, and soils. So, I mean, I mean, I agree with you. Most of the carbon is in these soils, and and, and they're huge um, sinks for carbon. So I, I I don't have any issue there. I would just like to see it expanded for biodiversity in particular and for water. So, 
how we came up, we come up with a system that would allow land to sort of be set aside for that on a significant scale. I'm just not quite sure. But one of the fortuitous things in New Zealand is a lot of our rangeland is kind of in upper catchment areas. And so I think there is a possibility there because they're so pivotal in determining, you know, what happens down catchment that we should be able to um, recompense, if you like, um, folk who manage in certain ways. But I mean, what's been advocated in the past, of course, is a development tax. So, you know, if you deplete the environment, then there's some environmental tax that then goes back to a help other people sustain the environment. It's, um, it is, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting concept and one, I, I, I just haven't seen, I mean, it, it, I know it works in some countries for some components of the environment, but, uh, and we're, I guess, doing it to a certain level with the nitrogen capping around Lake Rotorua, uh, Lake Taupo, sorry. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's possible. Lynn, did you have a question? Well, I'm um, I'm confused a little because of the biodiversity that you value biodiversity, but I, but then, I I'm in favor of people on their own land doing what they want, but it seems like it's impossible for them not to impact uh, the shared environment. In other words, if you, especially with biodiversity in in my homeland. <laughs> which is California, yeah. more than most, the most rich biodiversity does occur on private lands and it matters very much mm, to the yeah. sum total of biodiversity in the state, how private landowners manage their land. And of course, there's all kinds of philosophical arguments about what you can and cannot tell or should or should not, what's ethical in terms of yeah. private land. I don't want to get into that, but I'm just saying that I don't, I just don't think that's possible to say that it doesn't, that it's okay, just do whatever you want. I mean, a, a monocultural forestry plantation cannot be good for biodiversity, can it? I just can't imagine that. Um, and also, I, I really encourage you to be concerned about the future and fire. The, the, in my state, they're just fodder for fire, yeah. uh, which is devastating. So I, 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 I don't know, I can't, um, I can't sort of wrap my head around water. It's obvious water flows off the land, it's dirty or it's clean, but biodiversity also is very heavily influenced by what happens on each part of private land. Also, the other thing that makes that particularly important in California is because of the qualitative differences between private and public lands, our mm. private lands are tend to be certain kinds of education types and our state or public lands another. And it seems like that's how things are playing out with tenure review too, which it kind of exacerbates mm. the situation because the majority of some habitats are then in one form of land ownership or another. So yeah. I'm a little- you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, th thanks for that. I mean, I, I was, I was, I was slightly flippant about, you know, I don't care what they do on their land. Um, but I, one of the things that we that I've we struggle to do in New Zealand is to to look at what the end game would look like environmentally. In other words, what are we trying to do with the positive things that we want from the environment? You know, for biodiversity, for water, for soils, and I mean, I think we could develop for biodiversity at least, a picture of what we want to protect it where and what it would contribute overall. Um, but there seems like there's, there's, there's apprehension on both sides. We don't want to lose any biodiv indigenous biodiversity on the one hand versus um, agriculturalists and developers who are sort of anxious that they don't want to lose any potential for what they want to do. And so I think one of the things about working with indigenous people is that we we could actually with maori develop a framework if you like or a picture of where new zealand is going in terms of the natural environment in other words how do we want that configured what would we like it to look like and i think that would help policy makers enormously but thanks mm -hmm.